Today on Newswatch, the death toll rises in Italy after a massive earthquake strikes the country. We'll show you the scope of the damage. Plus, did you know the Quran never mentions Jerusalem? We'll dig deeper and debunk the myths fueling the fight over the Holy Land. And a military family fighting battles at home with two disabled children and a mountain of bills. See how CBN has been helping this soldier and his family on the home front. And thank you for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. A strong earthquake rocked central Italy early this morning, hitting a region swelled with summer tourists. At least 37 people are dead and the death toll is rising. As Heather Sells reports, rescuers are racing to dig out survivors. It happened at 3.30 in the morning local time as residents and tourists slept. People felt the magnitude 6.2 quake across a broad section of central Italy, but the towns of Amatrice and Accumoli suffered the most. We need chainsaws, shears to cut iron bars and jacks to remove beams. Everything. We need everything. The race is now on to pull victims from the rubble. Rescuers are digging people out with shovels, bulldozers, even their bare hands in order to reach survivors before it's too late. For those who made it out, there are stories of miracles. On one side, the whole wall fell on this side and did not hit me. On the other side, it fell as well and did not hit me, but fell just next to me, very close to me. And luckily, it didn't hit me. Then the whole ceiling fell on my head. I just managed to get a pillow on my head and I wasn't hit. Italy is known as an earthquake-prone region. That's because geological faults run up and down the country. This latest quake is already being compared to one in 2009 that killed more than 300 people and struck just 50 miles to the south. In Rome today, the Pope skipped his normal catechism lesson and led pilgrims in prayer for the earthquake's victims. Meanwhile, rescuers are hoping to find as many survivors as possible, and those who made it are struggling to make sense of what has happened. We are living through this immense tragedy. I really don't know what to say. We are living through this tragedy, and we are only hoping that there will be the fewest number of victims possible and that we all have the courage to move on. Germany, Israel, and France have already volunteered to help Italy with rescue efforts and recovery for this region that has changed literally overnight. Heather Sells, CBN News. President Obama visited Louisiana Tuesday after a deadly flood swept through the state last week. He said the nation is heartbroken by the loss of life and promised residents they were not alone in recovering from the flood. CBN's Operation Blessing is still on the ground, working to bring aid and relief to the area. The volunteers from uh, Operation Blessing in coordination, I guess, with Home Depot, uh, those people have been awesome. I mean, just great people, um, honest, hardworking people. And uh, very friendly, very, very cordial, very, uh, I'm not sure how to say it, kind of in touch, sort of, with what we're going through. They respect that, and they've been courteous about that, and they've been very conscientious about, you know, our feelings and how, you know, what it is that we're dealing with right now. So much more help is needed to learn how you can help with Operation Blessings efforts. Simply go to ob.org. Hillary Clinton is in the headlines again after the latest release of nearly 15,000 emails, but now she's under fire for her private meetings with big donors to the Clinton Foundation while she was Secretary of State. A new report shows at least 85 out of 154 people from special interest groups who met with her also donated a total of $156 million to the foundation. The Clintons made the State Department into the same kind of pay-for-play operation as the Arkansas government was. Pay the Clinton Foundation huge sums of money and throw in some big speaking fees for Bill Clinton, and you got to play. A number of those donors are from foreign governments. The discovery leads some to question Clinton's reliability if she is elected president. North Korea fired a ballistic missile from a submarine today. The missile flew about 310 miles before crashing into the Sea of Japan. 
In a rare display of unity, the foreign ministers of China, Japan and South Korea put aside their disputes to sharply criticize North Korea's provocative act. North Korea also threatened a preemptive nuclear strike this week as South Korea and the United States began annual military drills. Meanwhile, the U.S. does plan to deploy a new missile defense system in South Korea next year. North Korea calls it an act of war, but Pentagon officials say the system is necessary to protect America's regional allies. Lucille Toulousen brings us that story from Seoul, South Korea. July 8th. South Korea and the U.S. agreed on the missile defense deployment to counter North Korea's nuclear threats. It's known as THAAD, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense. THAAD is a very powerful advanced system of radar interceptors that can intercept incoming ballistic missiles above the atmosphere. It comes at a critical time after North Korea's foreign ministry recently described sanctions imposed against leader Kim Jong-un as the worst hostility made against the country. North Korea's top official Han Son Rol confirmed that they recently launched a ballistic missile into the sea out of the East Coast. These kinds of launches are payback for U.S. sanctions, which is nuclear blackmail. The U.S. will pay a terrible price for these sanctions. Americans detained in North Korea will be treated with loss of war and be given many years of hard labor. The deployment of the THAAD system has caused renewed tensions between the U.S. and South Korea on one side and Russia and China on the other. But political experts here say that this is the time for South Korea to take a stronger stance against North Korea's provocations. China is worried that THAAD can shoot down their missiles. But nuclear experts say this will not happen because China is thousands of miles away from South Korea. The THAAD radar only sees 250 miles. South Korea needs the THAAD now, even though it may affect the relation with China. China will not protect us from the North's nuclear threats. Paul Shim was a former lieutenant colonel of North Korea military. He escaped from North Korea in 1997 after hearing God's truth through sermons on the radio. I read the Bible for the first time. As I read it again and again, I realized that God is alive and He is the truth. I prayed for North Koreans to get to know Jesus Christ. One day, I heard a clear message from God to leave. Paul Shim is now a pastor in South Korea. He looks after the spiritual life of mostly North Korean Christians and continues to be concerned over the political affairs in the peninsula. Kim Jong-un proclaims that North Korea will unify the peninsula with the use of nuclear power. In fact, the revolution for democracy and the liberation of the Korean peninsula is declared as North Korea's duty in the Workers' Party laws. I think the U.S. and South Korean governments should take this ideology of the regime seriously. Does North Korea really have a strong nuclear defense capacity? North Korea has made strenuous efforts for more than six decades to become a nuclear state, and that it will continue to do so in the future. They keep saying that they successfully miniaturized missile warheads, made a hydrogen bomb and will strike the U.S. I don't think that's true for now. But the regime will strive to develop its nuclear capabilities to that level. Shim added that even under a Donald Trump administration, American troops are likely to stay. He believes they are present not only for South Korea, but for the peace and stability of the region and the world. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Seoul. And back here in the U.S., California lawmakers have passed a bill targeting the state's religious colleges and universities over LGBT students and discrimination. Many religious schools were concerned the original bill would force them to violate their Christian beliefs, so the measure was adjusted. It still requires schools to inform students and facility if they claim any exemption from rules against discrimination. Coming up, debunking myths about the Middle East. Find out who really has the right to claim the Holy Land for home.
The Holy Land, it is well known as the source of a deadly dispute between Jews and Palestinians. Yesterday, we examined the claim Palestinians have lived there for thousands of years, and we learned that is not true because there was never a Palestinian people group before the term was invented just a century ago. Today, we bring you part two of this debate as Gordon Robertson takes a closer look at the religious claims to the land. Arabs claim Jerusalem as the Islamic city of Al-Quds. But there's no record that the Prophet Muhammad had ever been there. And even his armies didn't arrive there until five years after his death. The city of Jerusalem isn't mentioned even once in the Quran, while the Hebrew Bible mentions it more than 600 times. In Muhammad's lifetime, it was a fairly unimportant city in the Byzantine Empire. It was a Christian city without a single mosque. When the Muslims conquered Jerusalem, they chose to build their mosques on the Jewish Temple Mount, believing it to be a holy site. There they built the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa, whose name was copied from the story of the night journey in the Quran. Several Muslim scholars placed the construction of the mosque around 690, while Muhammad died in 632. So how could Muhammad's famous night journey have taken him to a mosque in Jerusalem that wouldn't be built until after his death? The Quran doesn't mention Jerusalem, but says that Muhammad's dream flight took him to Al-Aqsa, which means the farthest place. Early Islamic scholars interpreted that to mean a heavenly place, or the courtyard of Allah. That all changed as Islam evolved into a political force. During the Crusades, the Muslim general Saladin changed Islamic tradition to strengthen the Muslim claim to Jerusalem. He stated that Muhammad's flight took him not to heaven, but to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And today, the Jewish Temple Mount is also the third holiest site in Islam, second only to the Arabian cities of Mecca and Medina. Muslims believe that once they claim a piece of land, it belongs to Islam forever. Still, at the beginning of the 20th century, Islamic leaders acknowledged the Temple Mount's Jewish history. In 1924, Jerusalem's Supreme Islamic Council published this tourist pamphlet on the Temple Mount. It says the site's identity with the site of Solomon's Temple is beyond dispute. This, too, is the spot, according to the universal belief, on which David built there an altar unto the Lord. The pamphlet also describes the underground chamber the Crusaders called Solomon's Stables. It dates probably as far back as the construction of Solomon's Temple. In 1927, a strong earthquake damaged the mosque, and during renovations, archaeologists analyzed the structure. They found beams made from cedar of Lebanon and Cyprus, dating as far back as the 9th century BC, around the time of King Solomon, who had used those very materials to build the first Jewish temple. The excavations also uncovered a Jewish ritual bath from the second temple, and a mosaic believed to be part of a Byzantine church. Most historians agree the Jews were here first, but the Arabs will argue that they were here the longest, and the so-called right of return has been a constant theme at every Middle East peace summit since 1948. From the Crusades until the 19th century, the Arab population had only grown from around 200,000 to 300,000. Arab growth was stagnant, and population experts say it would have stayed that way, except for one thing, the arrival of the Jews. 
With the waves of Jewish immigration starting in 1882, Arabs started flooding into Palestine from neighboring countries. And they came for two reasons. One, to enjoy a higher standard of living in Palestine. And two, to fight the immigration of the Jews who made that standard of living possible. By 1948, the Arab population of Palestine was 1.3 million. The British governor of the Sinai once remarked, it is very difficult to make a case for the misery of the Arabs if at the same time their compatriots from adjoining states could not be kept from going in to share that misery. Some experts say, if the Palestinian Arabs want a legal return to their countries of origin, they would have to return to places like Egypt, Iraq, Morocco, and Syria, but not to Israel. Today, many world leaders call on Israel to return to its 1967 borders. But if you look at history, those borders aren't from 1967. In fact, they're not even real borders. The borders of the West Bank are an armistice lines which were created by results of the war of 1948. And at the end of the war, this is where the armies stood still this is how the quote-unquote border of 1967 or of 1949 was created. So the 1967, which is an armistice line, served as a border between Israel and the state of Jordan. And the state of Jordan also annexed the West Bank and it became part of Jordan. When Jordan occupied the West Bank and East Jerusalem in 1949, the Jews were ethnically cleansed from both places. At least 30 synagogues were destroyed, and Jews were banned from holy sites like the Western Wall, while Palestinian Arabs living there automatically became Jordanian citizens. So Israel can't go back to the so-called 67 borders for three reasons. One, before 1967, the West Bank was controlled by Jordan, not by the Palestinians. And Jordan's annexation of it violated international law. Two, the land was legally promised to the Jews by the British Mandate of 1922. And three, there was no Palestinian state in 1967, forever. As Golda Meir once said, how can we return the occupied territories? There is no one to return them to. The term occupation is when you possess a, something which is not yours or which is someone else's. This is not the case of the West Bank. When you talk about occupation, Yes, there were many occupations over the West Bank, starting with the Babylonians and Assyrians and Greeks and Romans, all the way to the Ottomans and to the Brits. To call the Jews occupiers in their own home, this is really a unique travesty of history. The West Bank was never held by the Palestinians. They were never sovereigns. In fact, there was no other sovereign over the West Bank than the Jewish people. Up next, an American military family fights a new battle just to pay the bills. See how CBN viewers like yourself are helping the home front. While her husband serves in the Army overseas, Natalie takes care of the family all alone. Two of their children need special medical care and the bills have been piling up. So CBN decided to give this hardworking couple some extra help. Sergeant Rubin is proud to serve in the United States Army, but admits it's hard leaving his wife Natalie and his children behind when deployed overseas. 
It's a sacrifice that comes with serving his country. It makes me proud every day. It just reminds me what he is, a soldier protecting our country. Home life is challenging for Natalie because daughter Ariel has a heart defect requiring extra care. Their son Jaden has autism causing him to run away. With Jaden and his autism, it's, it's definitely hard taking him somewhere because he'll just take off and run and, and it's hard for me with two other kids to chase after him. The kids get very little outdoor play time. They couldn't buy a swing set for their fenced in yard because money was tight. They had medical bills and the boys needed dressers. Going into debt to buy the swing set wasn't an option. It's just more bills that just stack up higher and higher. And um, you know, it's tough to already pay the bills that I have now. The couple attends a military support group near Fort Campbell called Force Ministries. Force asked CBN's helping the home front to help and we said yes. Director Greg Wark told the couple CBN was buying the boys' furniture and providing $1,000 to cover medical expenses. Now, does that relieve a little bit of stress? Yeah. So much stress. Not and, a <laughs> it doesn't stop there. They're going to buy you an entire play set and have it put up in your yard, all assembled so that your son will have his own wonderful place to play. <laughs> it's awesome. And we want you to know that it's our prayer that God would alleviate some of the pressure that's on you and give you the ability to take a breath. Thank you very much. Within a few weeks, the furniture was delivered and the kids' playset installed. <laughs> Reuben knows that the next time he deploys, there's a lot less stress on Natalie and the children. I'm very thankful for uh, CBN and helping the home front that there's something out there for soldiers and, and veterans and that you could definitely use the help and, and take that weight off their shoulders. And you can find more stories about how CBN is helping the home front at CBN.com. Stay with us. We're coming right back. And finally, a word for your Wednesday, and today's word is peace. Remember this, be at peace in all situations because the God of peace lives inside of you. And with that word, make this a wonderful Wednesday. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. And take the time to tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do that on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us again right here tomorrow. Once again, make this a wonderful Wednesday.